charity called Tikal, which I think some of you will know means sustainable or durable in Hindi. And I should say to start with, if I get something terribly wrong, um, there's some Indian people here, you might want to correct me. But um, please feel free if I do get something wrong. But if there are any questions, uh, maybe we should save those until the end. Um, but I'm open for correction if I do make a terrible mistake about India or Indian culture. Um, hopefully I won't. Um, so I got involved with this charity um, called Tikal Share, and um, that's um, based mainly in one village in Odisha, in Orissa, um, which is, as some of you probably know, a state in northeastern India. Well, eastern India anyway, not right up in the northeast, but on the east coast. And it's concentrating on one village, which is a Dalit village. Um, uh, I think most of you will understand that the Dalits are at the bottom of the caste system in India. So that caste system is um, still in existence, although things are getting better for Dalits. They're more socially mobile than they used to be. But this, this village where we've been working, very poor, especially poor village, and there is still a lot of poverty in India. I don't think anyone is going to correct me about that. But uh, um, things are improving. But this, um, the, the point of this project in this village is to kind of improve the, the welfare, um, the development of the villagers, and, and mostly uh, women artisans who are making uh, basketware, bamboo and basketware mainly, um, lamps, baskets, uh, it's mainly laps actually, and we'll see some more of those. So these are, see, these are some of the women in the, in the, in the uh, artisan groups. Can you guess what it is they're wearing? These are not ordinary saris. Or... So these are actually used yeah, fin air business class yeah. blankets, yeah. which, um, yeah. because fin air was supporting this charity uh, for some time. Um, giving extra kilos to take to uh, of donations to the village and uh, helping in various small ways and this was one of the ways that they were helping. So, and that's how I came to write an article for the magazine Blue Wings about this village. So, um, I thought this picture would be a nice, nice way to start. Um, so I'm going to show with, with each area um, a general map of where we're talking about. So tell me, I'm going to be looking at my laptop, so if something doesn't come up on the screen, you better shout at me, okay? So these are some of the artisans in the village. These are some of the products. This is taken a little while ago, so the, um, the bamboo products have, have developed and, and got better <coughs> quality. That's part of the point of the project, is to improve the quality of the handicrafts so that they can be sold at a higher price um, in the shop in Helsinki. I'll give Tikal one advertisement. It's in Koke Vorinkatu, and it's a lovely little shop where you can buy this stuff. Um, and not only from this village, they're, they're also selling stuff from, from other villages in India, handicrafts. Um, but this is a Dalit village, as I say. Um, it's a, it tried to be founded on a kind of democratic principle, so here the ladies are taking a vote. I can't remember on what, but... Um, Half of them are approving and half of them aren't. aren't but. So, this is uh, a view of the village, this particular village, just to give you an idea of the kind of environment of it. And I think this illustrates in a way how the, the, um, the business or the, the, the business mindedness of the villagers has been improved because this was taken maybe four or five years ago and since then they have learnt that they should not put their baskets and their lamps next to the cow dung. So <laughs> you could say that this is an improvement in their attitudes towards the business. But the cow dung, having said that, is very useful for all sorts of things. Um, it's uh, The cow, as you, in Hindu religion, is of course a, a, a holy animal, but it's also a very useful, economically useful animal um, or property for villagers, especially in these situations can get food from it. Um, you can use the dung for as a building material and also as a fire, as, as fuel for fire. So that's a lot of different uses. So but anyway, this is um, gives you a rough idea of what this village is like. It's very basic. 
in the, you can see the straw roofs there. In the monsoon season, these roofs will come apart, and that's something else that the charity has been trying to improve. And then we're talking mainly about women here, not to forget the theme. So it's uh, mainly women artisans who are benefiting from this project, and they have benefited. So here's a few pictures of them, and there's a fellow in the back. The fellows, the, the guys are also involved in weaving. Um, so I think it's true to say that before we got involved with, these village, with, with this village, the, the villagers had never traveled more than, say, 30 kilometers to their local main town, which is the town of Balasor in uh, Odisha. Um, so one big development was that some of these ladies have taken their handicrafts to Delhi, which is a hell of an adventure for them. It's like a 23-hour train journey. And they, they've got the confidence now to, to go there and to sell their goods in, in the craft fairs in Delhi. So I think this is a sign of progress. And just a couple more pictures. She's not looking too happy. I can't remember why not. But uh, you get lovely light on these ladies' faces. So maybe this is a good time to step back a bit and say why I'm, why I'm so interested in going to India. Because there's always a surprise around the corner in India for a photographer. There's always something uh, that takes you by surprise. A visual surprise, something happening, an event, a festival, or just a little... A little um, Currents in the street, some street life of some sort. So it's very inspiring. The other thing to emphasize is that uh, in this talk, I want to put across the diversity of India because uh, it is very often thought that India is one kind of cultural entity. But if you travel through India to different parts of the country, you'll soon kind of get the idea that it varies geographically, well, geographically obviously, but um, in terms of the landscape, in terms of the culture. Uh, even in terms of the food, so it's not all curries and rice, it's all sorts of different things. I know the Indians will know what I'm talking about here, and I'm stating the obvious, I expect. But, but still, it's more like a continent, so if you think of, um, if you think of Norway and Spain, it's the same difference between, say, Himachal Pradesh in the north, in the mountains, and Kerala in the south. It's really so much different. So India is lots of different countries really, lots of different nations in one nation. So I'm hoping that this will also, this is an opportunity showing these ladies from different places to put across that point. That it's a very diverse country in many ways. Um, yeah, before I move on. So the thing that impre impressed me from the, from the word go when I went to this village was the very poor people, but they, the women especially, always make themselves look so beautiful. So they take the time and the trouble to dress beautifully, um, beautiful jewellery, beautiful clothes. Very simple point, but it impressed me very much. And again, great for photography. It was a kind of a privilege that shows you the range of the population in the village. So the little babies and very old people. Um, I've interviewed quite a lot of them, and some of them were, uh, many of them don't even know how old they are. So they could be as old as 100, they could, be, or they think they're as old as 100. And in fact, they're more like 75. But but um, anyway, let's move on. So yeah, this is to show you that these products do actually end up um, in places in the West. So this is the cafe in Alexandra in Kotu in Helsinki. Um, I think it's called Ihana Cafe. Um, it's around the back of the university. So a lot of these lamps that are, that are made in the village are hanging there as one example of how they find a home in the West and especially in Finland. And I think we're going to move on to Himachal Pradesh, which I've just mentioned, which is up in the mountains, north of Delhi. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll show, I'm, I'm going to show with some of these um, locations a little bit about the environment of the place, some scenes, just to give a kind of context of where the ladies live. So this is the... Um, foothills of the Himalayas. This is actually where the Dal Dalai Lama has made his home with the Tibetan diaspora. And um, this picture was actually taken from the gents' toilet of the, the Dalai, Lama's, Dalai Lama's temple in Dharamsala. So if, if you've ever been to the um, Torni Hotel, the view from the toilet there is also very good. <laughs> but I, think this is, um, I think this has got the edge on that view. So. 
and so it gives you an idea of the kind of the layout of the of the city there, which is built on the side of the mountains, basically. The mountains come up very quickly from the plains here, so it's quite dramatic. This is the kind of landscape they've got up there. Very beautiful. So the point of me going here this time, and I've been here a couple of times, I've got some friends who run a homestay there, who I will introduce you to later, but um, I wanted to find women who play cricket in India as part of this project. And I found out that in, because you don't you see kids playing cricket everywhere, men playing cricket everywhere, with um, makeshift, makeshift um, bats, balls, wickets. This is a foreign language to the Finns, I know, but bear with me. So all the stuff you need to play cricket. But you very, very rarely, in fact, I don't think I ever saw women or girls playing cricket in the street. So I wanted to go and find some who do. So I went to the Himachal Pradesh Cricket Association Academy for Okay, it's not only for girls, but they have a, a, an academy for, for ladies. So many of them are residential, um, so they are, they spot the talent from, oh, wait a minute, before we go any further, I should say something about the stadium. This is the Himachal Pradesh Association Cricket Ground, Cricket Association Cricket Ground, and um, I, for me, it was one of the, the most amazing cricket grounds I've ever seen. And if you did get bored with cricket, which let's face it, some of us sometimes do, You've got a fantastic view of the Himalayas instead of watching the cricket, so well, if you're facing it that way anyway. Um, but it really is quite a dramatic ground. Um, and I went there to visit these girls who are at the, at the academy and to photograph them. And I have to say again at this point, uh, make another point, and that is the pictures you're seeing here are the tip of the iceberg. I've got thousands and thousands of pictures of India, so we're following one particular theme here, and these are selected pictures from illustrating that theme, which is Women of India. So here then, <coughs> excuse me, I need a drink. <coughs> Maybe something stronger. <laughs> so I should go back to this lady actually, because I interviewed a couple of them. <coughs> Any of you who know anything about cricket, you'll see that she's dressed to bat, but she is in fact um, a bowler. It's her speciality, so throwing the ball, that is, for those who don't know. Um, so, yeah, a word about Indian cricket and women playing cricket in India. So, well, of course, cricket is one of the better things that the British Empire left in its wake. Um, I think Indians would agree with that. But um, now, as I think uh, Lisa, Lisa mentioned, oh, no, um, the other lady here mentioned uh, earlier, women in India are starting to play cricket more, and they're getting better at it. So... Um, and they, they like watching it too, in, in greater numbers. So the Indian women's team, for example, made it to the World Cup final in England in 2017, but I'm sorry to say they were beaten by England. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, this young lady, she's 16, year old, 16 years old, or she was when I met her, so she'd be about 18 now, it was a couple of years ago. And um, her name is Anshika Chandel, and it's a name you should remember because she hopes to be a future star and um, as I say, yeah, well, yeah, it's her dream to play cricket for India. So these girls are very ambitious. So it's an example of how the younger girls in, in, in India have really have the confidence to do, they, they really have their, their sights set on doing great things. Now, I've got to go back to the beginning again a little bit now, because one of the points of doing this was to show this other side of women of India. That is, you, you hear stories about um, some bad things happening to women in India. And there's no, there's no getting away from the fact that there are some bad things happening to women in India, and I don't have to go into the details of that. But part of the idea of this was to show that women are in no way subservient, they are in no way kind of uh, inactive in, in putting themselves forward, in being ambitious, in being confident, and the idea of this was to show some examples of that, so the positive side of women in India. So this, I think, is a very good example to start with these young ladies who really have a dream of playing for India. There, again, you can see how amazing the setting of the cricket ground is. So these are the, the, um, the beginnings of the real Himalayas just here. And here they all are, this, this junior and the senior team. And then we're going to move across. We've got a bit of territory to cover here. So I've covered a lot of ground in India. Um, and more recently, I've been traveling to northeast India. Um, 
to the states there, which are attached by a very thin uh, strip of land to kind of the main part of India here. So there's a lot of little states here which aren't quite so well known, so I thought it's interesting to, to drop into those as well, because you might not have heard about all of them. So Manipur is the, is the one we're going to now, and the reason we're going here is because... Okay, now first of all, I'm going to show you one little tourist highlight, which is this lake just outside the, uh, the capital, Impal, which is a fabulous lake with this special weed growing in it. So this is the main tourist attraction. Uh, just outside Impal. It's, it's quite an amazing place actually. just goes on for miles. Um, but this is why the main reason that I went to Impal was to visit the Marycom Cricket Academy. And as the Indians here will know, Marycom is probably, well, I would, probably the most famous sportswoman in India, would I be right in saying? She's very well known anyway. And that's because she is um, a champion boxer. Um, she won a Olympic bronze in 2012, and she's won all sorts of other medals. And she wanted to encourage the sport, um, and she opened this academy, which is from Impal, which is where she comes from. And I wanted to go. I actually wanted to visit her, but that wasn't possible. So that's her in the picture behind the lady here. So it's her academy. She sets it up. It's a trust uh, foundation, so women can come from different parts of Manipur. Uh, or late girls actually, but it's for, it's for younger ladies and quite young girls up from about 40 to early 20s. Uh, they've got about 67 um, people in the academy and they've also got guys there, so it's not only women. But the kind of unusual thing about it is that they are paying special attention to women and, um, and their aspirations to box. So, this uh, young lady was posing for me, and I, I really, these guys, these girls are really tough. I didn't want to mess with them. So <laughs> that's Mary Com peering over her shoulder there. <coughs> but they, they knew what they were doing. I didn't stand in their way. I wouldn't have tried boxing with them. So um, again, this young lady, um, I interviewed some of these ladies when I was there, and this is 17 year old. Again, she's about a year or two older now. Her name is Ting Miller Dungel and she spent four years at the academy when I talked to her and she was a member of the Indian first place team at the 32nd International Silesian Women's Championships in Poland in 2018. She was very proud of this. And um, Mary Com, she says, the, the champion boxer who founded this academy, is her idol and she wants to follow her example and be a champion and to be an Olympic champion one day. So again, these young girls have a lot of ambition, and I would like to think that this is kind of symptomatic of the new India. They, they know that they can go places, and they just they want to try. They're really ambitious. There's some more pictures of the training. Dangerous place. They're not boxing. They're just taking pictures. So there's, um, there's a percentage of them, it's about 50-50, I think, who are actually living there, and the others come in every day. Um, but it's, uh, they all seem you know, really motivated and very happy to be there. It's tough, the training is tough. It's, this is not amateur stuff, they really are training to be professional. Well, of course they won't all be professional, but that's what they want to be. Okay, uh, another special thing from a, a woman point of view in Impal is they have a woman's market, uh, which is, excuse me, while I find the right page, so I don't forget anything important. Um, so yeah, this market is called the Mother's Market, which is uh, Ima Ketel in the, late, the local language. Uh, it's about 500 years old, or it was established 500 years old, and there are about 5,000 women running the stalls and managing the whole place. So no men involved in this at all. So it is quite special in that way. And, um, yeah, of course, I, 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 I actually didn't know about this until I went there. I knew about the boxing thing, of course, because that's why I went there. But this, was a, this is the kind of thing you discover when you go to India, you find these nice surprises. And uh, markets, 
uh, are always a great place to photograph in India. Always colourful, always uh, lively. So it's always fun to spend some time in a, an Indian market. So I had the added incentive, this being a women's market. So I've got a few shots of this just to put across the, the colour of the atmosphere. Does everything look all right behind me? Yeah. <laughs> So just to put across, across the point that it's only women running the stalls, very colourful, very lively, very friendly, and um, they sell just about everything. And a lot of this stuff is made out um, out in the countryside. They bring it in and sell it in the, in the market in the capital. It's not a big state. The population is probably only a couple of million. So everything from temple decorations to fruit fish, and this lady is mending my trousers. No, she's not. <laughs> she could have been. Yeah, you could get anything done there. If you wanted your trousers mended, you could have got your trousers mended. So we're moving across to another northeastern state, which is Meghalaya. Uh, I don't know if any of you were here when I did a talk at the embassy about Meghalaya a couple of years ago or a year ago. Um, so some of this might be familiar. It's next, again, it's up in the northeast there, right up in the northeastern corner. One of the things about Meghalaya, one of its claims to fame, is it's one of the rainiest places on Earth. And in fact, it's supposed to hold the record for being the rainiest place on Earth. Um, <laughs> they build themselves as a land of breathtaking beauty and exotic people. I can't really deny that that's the case. So I can't really contradict that. Um, it was drizzling a little bit when I was there. It wasn't chucking it down. But I can imagine that it could be a really wet place when it's raining hard. Um, this is this spot here is the not just the state but this particular spot. Um, and the other another interesting thing about Meghalaya is mm -hmm. it's the place where you find these uh, living root bridges. So um, they train the roots into a bridge, to put it simply. This is a, I think it's a rubber tree. I know we got one expert on trees here, but so he might contradict me, but. Um, I think that's what it is. And they start off by training the roots a little and then they grow naturally to form the bridge. And so there's like a passageway going along the top here. And uh, so this was built as a practical bridge for the villagers on one side to get across to the other side. And it, this has probably been growing for at least 100 years. And uh, I was there when the river was not in full flood, but still, you, if, if it was in full flood, it would be a very handy bridge. You don't actually need it at the moment when, when this picture was taken, but, but they really are quite spectacular. It's quite a, and it's special to this state. I don't think you find them anywhere else. Maybe on the in the neighbouring states somewhere, but it's special to the state. This is the capital Shillong, just to give you an idea. And okay, there's a special aspect to okay, a couple more landscapes just to. This is the kind of landscape, quite wet, quite cloudy, but very beautiful. They actually say it's the Scotland of the east. I didn't really think it looked much like Scotland, but they say it, um, bore some resemblance, it bears some resemblance to Scotland, but I don't really think so. So, from a, um, the women's point of view, this is a little bit detailed, so I'm going to have to read from the notes. So, Meghalaya is um, a Kazi and Garo tribal culture, both of which are based on the matrilineal society system. So, um, I, I was actually especially looking at the Kazi type and the Kazi the Kazi tribe is the majority tribe in the state. So it's one of the largest surviving matrilineal cultures in the, in the world. So that means that the women traditionally have a dominant role, but it's not the same as being matriarchal. So the guys are still the bosses, I'm sorry. Um, but the younger daughter, the youngest daughter, inherits the ancestral property. And after marriage, the husbands live in the mother-in-law's home, and the mother's surname is taken by the children. So when no daughters are born to a couple, they adopt a daughter and pass their property rights on to her. So the birth of a girl is celebrated in the state, whereas in other parts of the country, not so much maybe. Um, and so there's not so much social stigma for women either. Um, they, they, for example, if they get divorced or they give birth out of wedlock. But it has to be said that the men are still uh, kind of in control. So these ladies, um, I had a guide there, or a fellow who was a photographer working for another NGO, another charity, 
who was with me most of the time, showing me around. His name was Clinton, very nice chap. And this is his family. They, he took me to see his family, and we had dinner there. And uh, this is his sister on the, in the middle there with her daughter, her baby, Aminia, the mother, Nelifa, and her mother, Mary, the older lady, who is from the Mompa tribe of Arunachal Pradesh, which is going to be my next stop in the northeast of, in of India in April. So four generations of ladies here in the family home in Shillong. And um, so they took me to a village, um, the, the, the charity that Ms. Clinton works with, which is called the Faith Foundation, which actually is not based on religion, although they are religion, they're religious, they're Christian, but it's not trying to convert the, the tribe, the natives to Christianity, it's just trying to do good work for the villagers, so, and succeeding. So fashion tip here, it's meant to be the Scotland of um, <laughs> India, and the ladies do wear these tartan scarves and uh, shawls, but they didn't seem to make any kind of connection between their, this, this, this fashion item and Scotland. They, they just like wearing this stuff. So anyway, this is the wife of the headman, and this is the headman, so you can see their house is quite nice. Um, but he's the kind of boss of the village, so... And then one of the villagers whose house is a little bit more basic. Excuse me. And then just some pictures of the <coughs> villagers, so... Some really nice... I just had fun taking pictures of the, the people here. And of course, the ladies. You know, I was looking for the ladies in particular, and they didn't seem to mind having their pictures taken, so... And they usually don't. So as I said, it's a Christian... Um, it's dominantly Christian, this area. And this was their little church in the village, and this was the, I, I guess she's like the church warden, she was looking after the place. So, you know, another maybe misconception might be that, you know, the secular aspects of India are, are being overtaken by the Hindu aspects. This is another subject completely, which I don't have time to go into, but there is a lot of diversity of religion as well still in different parts of India, and a lot of Christians in this area although they still have their kind of animalist, animistic, uh, tribal beliefs as well. So, this is one place in India where I haven't seen before women chewing betel nut. So that's what the red stain is in her teeth. And you see the guys in the cities and in other places chewing betel nut. Uh, but I haven't seen the ladies doing it anywhere before. I might be, you know, it just might be something I haven't seen, but seem to be unusual to this place that they, um, how are we doing? We're doing okay. Um, so that was kind of interesting, but they're doing a lot of hard work in the fields, so the women are still, they're not hanging around, or they're not just doing the housework, and the guys, it has to be said, are not always pulling their weight, doing, mostly you can see that they're not always as active in the fields doing the, the farming work as the women. So things aren't always easy for these ladies, even though they are, it is a matrilineal society. I had to show one of the, uh, this is the man of the house. He was, he looks pretty fierce there and a bit scary, but in fact he was very gentle and nice. So. But um, you've got to show the other side, you've got to show the guys as well sometimes, not just the ladies. So. And then I think there's one more, yeah. So the guy in the red t-shirt, this is Clinton, who was my guide, uh, very, dynamic young fellow, um, and uh, these are the people you saw there. This lady with the long hair, she comes from the charity, the Faith Foundation, and she had the wonderful name of Peaceful. <laughs> Beautiful name. They had some lovely names there, but yeah, I thought, uh, what better name could you, I suppose it's like a Rauha in Finnish. But, yeah. <laughs> so there you can get an idea of the village behind, the sort of environment they're in. Okay, we're going quickly to Kolkata, um, and I'll explain why before I put the picture up. So, the Hindu, the Hindu religion is just endlessly complex, and I'm, I can't, I, 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 I'm going to simplify some aspects of it, <coughs> and I apologise for that to any of you here who are following the Hindu faith, but it is just so complicated <laughs> for people who don't know all the details. And I've looked at it, and I'm interested in it, I find it really fascinating because it is so detailed and so complex. 
But the reason I uh, dropped in Kolkata, uh, just to give another bit of diversity, but um, it, I think it's in October, they have a big festival called the Durga Puja Festival in Kolkata. You're familiar with that? Yeah. Um, so that's when effigies of the goddess Durga, as well as her daughters, correct me if I've got this wrong, uh, Sarasvati and Lakshmi, uh, they are floated into the Hooghly River. And the Hooghly River is like a uh, delta tributary. Mm -hmm. Yes, what did I get wrong? They are not daughters. They are not daughters. What are they? We all call they are the same. So okay, so they're goddesses, deities. <coughs> I thought they were related. As you see, this is a minefield. <laughs> I have to say, okay, I, you better come up here and explain it again. Okay, um, all right, I, I apologize for the, some of the, but, but, but there is this big festival and it is the Durga Puja, I got that right. And they do float these deities, um, mainly of Durga. Uh, in the Hooghly River, which is like a, um, I think I believe it's one of the big tributaries of the Ganges when it enters the, the Bay of Bengal. So the the, the, the Ganges float, comes into the Hooghly River and into other tributaries. Um, I think I'm right about that. And um, anyway, it's the big river that goes through Kolkata. And you're probably wondering why I'm going on about this. So let's get straight to the point. So there's one little section of Kolkata um, where they are making these. Um, effigies of the goddesses and it's um, called Kurmatuli and I visited this place, uh, it's quite a famous place in Kolkata but it's really kind of fun to visit especially again to take pictures uh, because I wasn't there for the festival for the Durga Puja so I thought the next best thing is to go there and take pictures of these this um, artisan's area where they're making these effigies um, they make the effigies also of other uh, deities um, there's a bit of a story here. I th How are we doing for time? We're all right. Okay. So I, I, I wasn't sure if I'd have time to tell this story, but I'm going to read it. And <laughs> let's see if I got this completely wrong. And it's a little bit risque story. So most of the clay is brought by boat down the Hoogly River from a nearby village. And uh, what is actually particularly interesting is the, the ritual tradition of obtaining soil from a brothel and mixing it with the clay. Nobody's arguing yet, okay. It's considered to be Panya Mati, which, is, which means, I understand, blessed soil. And it's collected from a Nishito Pali, a forbidden territory. And apparently, according to one belief, when a man visits a brothel, he leaves his purity outside, and it settles into the soil, <laughs> out, soil outside, right? So others say that the soil is used to respect the purity of the prostitute's souls, uh, despite the pres profession they are engaged in. I think that's quite an interesting story, so I wanted to drop it in. But let's look at some more pictures of these deities. This is a really weird part of town because there are all these kind of half-naked statues of women, um, and pretty scary, actually, but it's great fun for taking pictures and for visiting these little artisan shops. So they're made out of clay and straw, and uh, they're just floated in the river. They, they don't recover the actual effigy but uh, it's meant to be sustainable in as much as the materials are returned to nature, the straw and the, the clay, but I think there's quite a lot of it in the river after the festivals. Have you actually been to the festival? Yeah? I'd like to go, yeah, one day. So here's an, another of the workshops. <laughs> kind of comical, but also a bit scary. So uh, am I right in thinking this is Kali? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, this is the goddess Kali. Um, who is meant to be scary. And um, so they're making other deities here which are directly, oh, there is another festival, I think, in, in Kolkata later, which is connected with Kali. And, um, but they're also making these images to export to even like Indian restaurants, for example, and other places outside India and in India and in neighboring countries. But still, it's a fascinating place. Okay, we're moving up very quickly to understand because there's a nice story here. You okay? <laughs> so, Rajasthan, I expect, is more familiar to you. It's kind of on the tourist golden, so-called golden triangle, uh, which people understandably go from 
Delhi to the Gold, to the Taj Mahal to the um, to Jaipur, Jodhpur, Jodhpur, yeah. so those big cities. Um, it's a kind of convenient week-long Golden Triangle trip. So Rajasthan is a little bit more on the tourist map, you might say. But I've got a nice story from here, <laughs> which I didn't know at the time, but I've been reading up about these uh, Bishnoi tribal ladies um, who inhabit the, especially the kind of region near Jodhpur. So I went to visit this village. Um, so, yeah, there's a nice tribal legend here, which I'm going to read to you. So, it's a legend from the 18th century, and it tells of a lady called Amrita Devi, who tied herself to a tree to prevent a forest being felled by the Maharaja of Jodhpur, who wanted the wood to build his palace. So the tale has it that 362 of Devi's fellow past villagers joined the protest. So, and all of them were killed by the Maharaja's soldiers, I'm afraid to say. But it kind of occurred to me that Amrita Devi was a, a very early Indian environmental activist, and it's a nice example of that. So, but I'm afraid the Maharaja got his wood, um, but she was very brave to resist in any case. But apart from that, these tribal ladies look very exotic and wonderful with their jewelry and their clothes. Um, so, that's the mission. We're moving away quickly from, we could spend a, long, a lot longer in each of these places, but obviously we don't have time. So now we're going down to Goa, which is also very uh, kind of, oops, on the, um, on the west coast, of course, and with a Portuguese influence. So I just showed this picture to kind of make the point that um, it's not only the, the British who have been um, colonizing India, the Portuguese, I think, got there quite a long time before us, in fact. So, and of course, the western side of India was the first that, the first part of India that, uh, explorers from Europe, tradesmen came to, so there's a big Portuguese uh, influence here. And in fact, the Portuguese were in uh, India longer, longer than the British, so, or the Portuguese influence, if you like, so it wasn't actually Portuguese people, but it remained a kind of colony within a colony, within, um, well, to start with, it was a colony within a colony, because um, it was part of the, part of British India, but then after uh, India got independence from Britain in 1947. The, that enclave continued as a kind of Portuguese protectorate or whatever the correct term is. So, but they started getting restless after the British got independence and they wanted to claim their own independence, complete independence and become part of the Union of India. So, we were on holiday there with my wife and um, I thought I have to do something I, I can't just sit by the pool all day, or it's a very nice part of the world to do that. I thought I had to contribute to this project somehow. So I, I did some research about interesting women in Goa, and I found an article by a journalist in the Times of India about these um, women who were uh, freedom fighters, basically. So there was a period between 1955 <laughs> and 1961, when, which is when they finally got their full independence, um, when there was this movement for independence, um, blood was spilt, there were small battles, and I met this lady. Are we going straight to a picture of this lady? I think so. And her name is uh, Libya Sardese, and I visited her in her home in Panjim, which is the capital of Goa. She's a lawyer, a solicitor. I can't, I, it's very hard to summarize what she told me because. I went to visit her and she spoke for over an hour. I couldn't get a word in edgeways. So I had this long uh, audio recording of what she told me, which was fascinating, but uh, I'll try to summarize it, which was basically that um, she helped to set up the Voice of Freedom, Freedom radio station. So the Indian government provided a transmitter and they operated it for six years from 1955 to December 1961. Now she was living out on this with this transmitter, which was on a mobile, like a, on a lorry or on a truck. So they were driving around the border areas of Goa, um, broadcasting in their own language, which is, wait a minute, Konkani, um, which of course the Portuguese, or, and, and the, the guys in, uh, the Portuguese guys, but also the guys 
the, uh, in the capital did not necessarily understand the language, so she was spreading insults in their own language. She was, she was very uh, colourful, this lady, when she was talking to me. Um, she lived out in the woods, in the forest, for those six years. Um, she's about, she's in her early 80s now. Um, very lively, very talkative for an 80 year old. And very good, spoke very good English too, but I couldn't say anything to her once she got talking. And um, so she said, we live there among snakes and wild animals. And I think I added a lot of years to my life living outdoors in the cold. So she broadcast twice a day from this transmitter. And as a result of the efforts that she and her fellow freedom fighters um, made, they got their independence eventually. But there was, a, it, uh, it's another story, I'm afraid. I can't go into all the details, but we don't have time. But it's another interesting story of a, um, an activist woman who made a difference, very confident, even then, this was like the 1950s, 1960s, early 1960s, uh, very assertive, um, got a lot of character. So just a few pictures. She was telling me stories of all the um, politicians she met at the time, and, uh, in Delhi at the conferences they were having to plan their independence. Where are we now? Oh, Pondicherry. So Pondicherry is another, to remind, another kind of example of the um, diversity of India. And this time it's the French, of course. So they had their own uh, enclaves. Pondicherry is the main one, but belonging to Pondicherry, which is also called Puducherry. Um, they had a couple of other smaller territories which were on the, or at least one smaller territory, which I think is on, which is kind of part of Kerala on the other side. Um, and so I went there to do an article for Blue Wings actually, but just to show you, to give you a kind of flavor of the place. Um, this is the promenade, which has a kind of very French character. Again, it's, it's quite different from the other parts. So even the policemen wear gendarme uniforms. So this is, kind of exotic and colourful. Um, I've got to go a bit quicker now, but I have to tell the story of this lady when we get to her. So just again, it's, it's actually a very pretty town by the sea. So this is, she's a former classical dancer, Vazanti Mane. She's the founder and designer of a company called Via Pondicherry, which is a fashion boutique and business. So, <laughs> Um, it's in the French quarter of the city, which and the back of the shop is this 17th century wooden bean house. So her ancestors made the choice offered to them in the 1880s uh, to take French citizenship along with a French name, so that's why she's called Manny. So she studied in France, but her mother tongue, yeah, her mother was a Tamil language teacher, so she says she's quite comfortable being between the French Christian and Indian, Indian Hindu cultures. Um, so there's a lot of this kind of, a lot of cultural diversity in India, another good example. This is in her shop. Um, not, not a great picture, but you get the idea. Um, very interesting, nice lady. And quite typical of a kind of modern Indian entrepreneur, lady entrepreneur, opening her, her own business, her own shop, doing quite well with it. Okay, got to move along. So we're going up to Himachal Pradesh and to, this is Uttarakhand, which was my last, the last place I visited in India. Um, so you get an idea here of the fantastic scenery, which is again Himalayas, foothills of the Himalayas, and Himalayas proper actually. So these are mountains of about 6,000 up to 7,000 meters in this part of the, the this Himalayas proper. So really fantastic mountain views here. Good place for little trek day treks and or for even longer treks. So I went to visit here again. This wasn't planned. It was kind of a nice little accident. And just a moment. I'm going to have to. Yeah, here we are. So this is a company called SOS Organics, and it's near the town of Almora in Uttarakhand, the state of Uttarakhand. So they make handcrafted, hand sorted products. Cosmetics, candles, herbal fusions, cereals, all with, um, all free from chemicals, artificial colors and preservatives, so very sustainable. And the big thing about them is they use, um, it's an area with big water shortages. So 
in, in these mountains generally. And so SA, SOS uses only harvested rainwater, uh, which it collects in these big uh, tanks. And also solar power, about 70% of its solar power. They have a very good foundation, which does good stuff for the local kids, uh, tr teaching them to pick up rubbish, which I'm very much in favor of, and uh, giving them some kind of conscience about the environment. So this was founded by this lady who I met. And so, how many of you have seen the Netflix film, uh, documentary called Wild Wild Country? Yeah. So this lady was part of that cult. So she was in, Amer in Oregon with, those, with, those, with that uh, group of, it's a group, a cult that moved from India. They were the devotees of um, a guru, Bhagwan Sri, also known as Osho. And um, it ended in tears, it's a long story, watch the Netflix videos if you haven't seen them, it's a really interesting series. But she landed on her feet very much, so she started this business, which is doing quite nicely. And she still believes in the, the tenets of this, I have to call it a cult, uh, because that's basically what it was, um, which was a kind of communal, uh, sustainable lifestyle, everybody working for each other in a community. And she's, she's done that on a smaller scale and without any kind of egos or without anybody spoiling it with um, getting involved in dodgy finances and that kind of thing, which is what happened with the, the uh, Sanyasin movement, as it was called. <coughs> so these are my friends in, oh, I'm running out of time, but I'll try to say something. Well, how much was that? Oh, five minutes, okay. <laughs> um, Okay, so these are my friends in Himachal Pradesh, um, in Dharamsala. This uh, lady on the, I, I met the lady's husband, the younger lady in uh, Delhi when we were doing a Tikal exhibition and became friends with him. And he mentioned that they were opening a guest house or a <coughs> homestay up in the mountains. So I've been <coughs> to stay with them a couple of times. And this is her mother, who is a wonderful old lady, very, uh, very gentle, spends all her time meditating, while Nazma, the younger lady, her daughter, uh, runs the guest house. It's only a small guest house. I recommend it. If anybody wants to go there, it's called Home in the Himalayas. And um, I'm trying to find the right page now, because I want to say something about her mother, who has a, had a very colorful uh, kind of history, life. Where the hell is it? <laughs> Yeah, okay. So, Nasma's father, the, the, the wife of this older lady, was a quite a, quite a well-known journalist with the Times of India. Uh, communist, Marxist, his name was Najmul Hassan. I don't know if anybody's heard of him. Uh, he was quite well-known in his time. He died in 1999. But um, this older lady was telling these stories about her younger life when she was experimenting with smoking and drinking and having a good time and partying. And now she kind of spends most of her time on the balcony of this place, looking at the mountains, meditating. So her lifestyle has changed quite a lot. But these are this, this a very, again, actually, an example of how family kind of takes precedence in India, because Nasma, they, they live, the, the husband lives with them too, or he's kind of coming and going, but he's, there, you know, they're together, they're a married couple. But um, she made a point when they got married, the mother has to live with us. so. I think that that kind of thing of looking after the elderly is quite typical in India, looking after the parents, which is something we've kind of, we're a little bit looser with in the West, perhaps, so maybe we've got something to learn there. So I'd like to say more about them, but I don't think I really have time. Uh, she was also a singer, the old lady. She doesn't sing anymore. I wanted her to sing to me, but she didn't. Um, so we'd better move on, much as I'd like to say more about them. But nice picture of her anyway. Very gentle, very kind lady, doesn't speak English, so I had to interview her through as mother daughter. Oh, Asa, what have we got in Asa? <coughs> oh yes, of course. Um, this is just to show you how beautiful a Indian bride. Now, is there a friend of this lady's in the room? Because there's somebody in Turku who spotted that I was doing this, and he knows this lady who is, my friend is Subrata, who lives in Asa. Um, and I went to her wedding and she just looked so fabulous. 
So I wanted to show, I could go into more details about the, the cult, the traditions of the wedding, but I just wanted to show these to kind of finish up with a bit because she looks so wonderful. Um, and there was somebody in Turku who spotted, who, who knows her, and he said that he would try to come to this talk, but he's not here, no? Okay. He would know who I mean if, if, I, if he was here, of course. So beautiful jewelry, beautiful henna on the hands. Uh, I was knocked out by how amazing she looked, so I was, was just, I couldn't stop taking pictures of her. And uh, I thought, just as a nice, colorful, almost conclusion, there's one more thing to show that I can do that quickly. And the wedding traditions are actually quite different in different parts of India, so they're not all uh, what, what you might expect from uh, some of the movies you might have seen. Some of them are a little bit more restrained. For example, there was no alcohol at this one. So it was, uh, at some I think there would be, but not at this one. That's the husband, Drakya, by the way, who was uh, the guy who was working in cooperation with Tikau for, the, um, for one of the NGOs, the local NGOs in Odisha. Uh, so we got to know him through that. Nice guy. I was talking to him the other day about my upcoming trip to... And then just one small thing. I know we need to finish, but I've got one small thing and it only takes a second. So back to Delhi. And this is something that's becoming more of a common sight, and that is seeing women in these kind of service point jobs, which might not have been so common in the past. So I found out about these ladies manning the gas pumps in, in this one particular gas station. There's probably four of them now in Delhi, which was unusual. It wasn't something that you found every day or in every gas station. It was usually men. But now the women are doing this kind of frontline service job more and more. And again, another sign of the kind of, you know, how things are changing, I think, for women in India. So, one more, and that's it. That's, thank you. So. <laughs> anything I didn't get right. Because there is a lot to know about India. Oh yes, oh I might have guessed. Yes. <laughs> no, you said you said earlier on that um, women were quite happy for you to take photographs of them. Did you have any problems anywhere in taking photographs of people, particularly women, in those kinds of situations? Uh, well, generally I was uh, I kind of arranged to visit these places, many of them. Some of them, as I said, were spontaneous. Um, so then it was understood when I went there that that's what I was gonna do. Um, so in those, in, in those places, at those times, no, obviously. But um, for example, in a market, like that market I showed you from uh, Impal in Manipur, um, not all the women were that happy about me taking pictures there, but that's, I'm, I know I have my own kind of procedures then in those situations. If they're not happy, I'll even try to chat them up and, you know, pers you know, make a little joke with them or something. And if they still not, they don't want to have their pictures taken, then I'll walk away because you, you, you know, they're not your property. I understand that. Of course, you always want to sneak a kind of candid shot of somebody looking interesting, so you have to kind of strike a balance a bit. But, but generally, if you, it depends on your approach. If you're trying to. Um, you make it a little communication, a little kind of contact with somebody, then quite often they don't mind, or usually they don't mind. But you know, they uh, they get a little shy, so it's also a good idea to take a few pictures or pretend to take a few pictures. But of course, with a digital camera, you can take lots of pictures, and you don't have to keep the bad ones. And but if, if they're relaxed a little bit after you've made a bit of contact, and then that helps. So it's actually a nice way of making contact with people. So having a camera, and depending on how you use it, if you're not too intrusive. 
then you can have these little, you know, these little encounters with people. Yes? Anybody else? <laughs> yeah, is there anybody else first before you have another one? Yeah. Man at the back. <laughs> What's the plan with the interview? Because you mentioned that you interviewed quite a lot of women, or you obviously did very good notes. So um, it depends. Plan? Like with that, with the lady in. Sorry, let me finish your question. No, that, that, that was it. Yeah. What's the plan with all that material? Uh, <laughs> okay, I should mention this, by the way, is we want to have an exhibition. So with the exhibition, there'll be kind of extended captions, but this is my plan anyway. So we have to work on some venues and um, and find some places to do this. So um, yeah, so there is a lot of, th th I've got nice interview material, yeah, for, for all of them, some longer than others. So for example, the lady in Goa, I was recording that while, we was, while she was speaking. So then I typed it up later. I mean, it took me a long time to get around to typing it up later because there was so much stuff. But, um, Will there be a book? Anybody want to buy a book? <laughs> What's the market? Will you sell it? <laughs> uh, one thing at a time. The exhibition first. Yeah. Um, a book about India I'm quite keen on, but we have that, that can't just be a book about India. It has to be kind of different themes within a book. Uh, this is a follow-up to my first question. Um, once, you've, once you've captured your image with the consent and cooperation of the subject, You've then got that image, and then you bring it back here to Finland. Yes. And you're showing it to us to an enthusiastic and sympathetic yeah. uh, well, understanding audience. That we're interested. I hope they're enthusiastic, yes. But how is it, how, sorry, this is more counseling for me now. Uh, how easy is it for you to transcend, take a picture in one culture, in one environment, one context, then take it somewhere else on the other side of the world and present it to another audience? who don't, you know, we don't, um, for instance, you said about Hindu religion and stuff like geography, all that kind of stuff. We don't know all about that. How easy is it to communicate the context, the meaning of your images in a different cultural environment? Well, how successful do you think I've just been? Because that's what I've just been trying to do, but obviously I can't go into the detail of each one. An exhibition would give me the opportunity to do that a little bit more, because then I would have some extended captions or have a little pamphlet available or something where the, the, there would be more information. And I'm going to have to, because I know somebody else asked the question, it's not fair if you get all the questions. So, somebody else? Yeah. Uh, was it difficult to find all these special characters for these ladies? <laughs> um, some are more difficult than others. Um, but the internet is a wonderful thing. <laughs> Um, the Lady in Goa was a bit of a challenge because there were a few candidates for that. But I have this, it's, this is a, one of the great things is I get to know people. I kind of made friends in different parts of India through this because, um, okay, I'm not seeing them every day or anything, but we're kind of in contact every now and then. So in Go Goa, there was a journalist, a young man who was working for the Times of India, and um, we're still kind of in touch. And he arranged this for me. And I, I mean, you know, people have really, they're, they're very helpful, people in India, if they know you're doing something interesting, and, and especially if you're doing something a little bit kind of, you know, that kind of is good for the image of the country, too. Because part of the idea of this is to provide a balance to, you know, India has been getting a bad press with regards to uh, what happens to women in India. And they are part of the idea of, of this was to kind of, balance things up a bit. You did a great job here. Thank you for that. You did a great job here. Thank, Thank you for that. That's the man speaking. I have to talk to the ladies as well. It's the people who get the bad name are supposed to be angry. <laughs> yes. Uh, I was just wondering what camera you're using. Oh, camera I'm using. Okay. Yeah, I like talking cameras, but I don't want to bore everybody. Um, so I use um, Fujifilm cameras. There you go. I'm really going to have to get some sponsorship from Fujifilm. <laughs> <laughs> so they are mirrorless cameras, so-called uh, digital cameras, and very good quality. They're, they're enough, yeah, enough, uh, enough, one of the reasons I use them is they are relatively, um, what's the word, inconspicuous, discreet, because they're not big, they're smaller cameras. So you're not kind of, okay, there are bigger lenses, there's a range of lenses, some are quite big, but 
If you're taking pictures in the market, for example, you can keep things fairly compact, so you're not scaring people as much as you would be. You're not kind of intimidating people as much. But again, that depends what you're doing with the camera. So Fujifilm cameras, yes, in a, in a nutshell. Yes. So you would find women doing that too? Yeah. A lot of older men they used to do that. Now, oh. by the government so much. Men, sure. No, women. women too. Women, yes. uh -huh. So has been discouraged heavily, so people have stopped doing it. But okay. <coughs> okay. Right, I hadn't seen it before yet. Yeah. So this gentleman was just um, pointing out that the beetle chewing, the nut chewing with the red their teeth, is not only, it's not only in Meghalaya where I saw this lady, it's in other parts of India where women also do this. So I haven't seen it anywhere else, but yeah. Especially older women, they do that quite often. Sorry? Especially older women in India, they... they older women, yes. yeah. Yeah, actually, that lady wasn't. <laughs> I was very surprised. No, she was probably older than me, but yeah. <laughs> but then I'm quite old. <laughs> okay, how are we going? Are we all right? We're going to get thrown out soon. Yeah, four minutes. Okay, one more. I need a drink of water. Any anybody else? Well, just just me. Yes. <laughs> if I can say, well. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, yes, this Did gentleman is yeah. the... Well, you explain who you are. Uh, <laughs> I'm Mark Kolemitz. I'm the president of Finnish Indian Society. And thanks on my part also that thank you that you are you are here ha having these Jim's very, very beautiful pictures and this his stories about the uh, It's a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. And as Tim said that we are planning to have an exhibition of, of this later this week. hope we get it later this year. Tim is pointing out, it's like it's like it's like a 